Hello guys, and I would like to welcome you to this week's Sunday School lesson. In this week's lesson, the pastor will share with you, 1 John chapter 4. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, if you would like to donate to our new Bethel Baptist Church Ministries, you can donate any amount to P.O. Box 18661, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and zip code 39404. God bless you guys, and enjoy the lesson. Hi, I'm Brother Lawrence Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And today our Sunday school lesson for August the 22nd, 2021 is A Conquering Faith. And our Bible scriptures today are taken from 1 John, the fourth chapter, verses 2 and 3, verses 13 through 17, and then the fifth chapter, verses 4 through and five. And we're still in this quarterly theme of confident hope. And our unit of study that we're dealing with now is faith gives us hope. Faith gives us hope. And we move into 1 John and re remembering John at this time, more than likely over 100 years old, was writing as a pastor to the churches there and but mainly the Gentile churches. And he was writing this letter because there were false teachers, or we like to say false prophets, but they were false teachers that were teaching things that were contrary to the scripture, teaching that Jesus Christ wasn't really there in the flesh. And, and Jesus and Christ were not definitely linked together. There could have been even two people that performed that one office. And and they, they had all types of things to not say that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. Not only that, but it was also a thing, it's also a thing even in our time. You would be surprised at the renowned teachers that we have now, the people that have the great names that are on the television and, and we see them all the time and speaking this and that. A false teacher or a false prophet, they wouldn't have to be 100% right all the time. They just have to be somewhere around 90%. And in that 90%, you hear that and you believe everything they say, even that 10%, which is contrary to the scripture. But a fault, but a true teacher, everything that they should teach, they should be able to tell you, okay, now go and study that and link it to and, and study it in reference with the word of God and see if I'm telling you the truth. When I begin to give you the text and the scripture on Sunday morning or Wednesday night, don't close your Bible. Go ahead and open it back up. I know we don't really have sometimes the, the actual Bible with us now where we open it up. We have the devices, but don't close the device. Don't, don't shut it down. Keep it open so that you can follow along. When they tell you or give you a message. See if that lines up with the word of God. See if it lines up with the scripture. It ought to line up with the scripture. And if it doesn't, then it, it's, 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 it's wrong. And that's that 10% that gets you to believing that the, because of the 90%, you believe the 10% that is erroneous teaching. Well, you'd be surprised at how many of them teach erroneous things. And then the test that they could be given is the same test that John gives here in this, is, this epistle that he wrote. He, he wrote these three epistles and, and then he wrote the one prophetic book in the New Testament, which is Revelation, and he wrote the gospel according to St. John. But here he gives this test and this test is, is the ultimate test. And a test or an exam is for you to see how far the student has come. See if they will be overtaken or deceived by some of these things. And Jesus talked about how these deceptive things would come in there in the 24th chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew. These these things, they'll, they'll come and, and they'll give all of this false stuff. And if it was possible, they would deceive the very elect of God the, the, said if it was possible. It's not impossible to totally deceive, but it is possible to deceive for a little while or those that have not truly come across yet. So he says here, he starts this out and it's not in our printed text, but I definitely want to deal with it. He said, beloved, 
Believe not every spirit, but try the spirit, whether they be are of God. Because many false prophets are going out into the world. That's what John said about that time. And this is why he was teaching this, because false prophets, were, and, and some of the false prophets, they were even people to try to make you think that you wasn't saved if you tripped up or stumbled and fell into some type of sin. And John tried to clear that up in the very first chapter of First John when he said, if you say that you have no sin, you deceive yourself. So he was trying to clear up all of these things that come in and try to make a person think that they're not saved and, and get them to saying, well, well, maybe this guy is right. Maybe this person, this woman is right. Maybe, maybe they're, they're on the right track. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, if the word of God is saying something definitely, totally contrary to what they're saying, who do you believe? Do you believe God? Remember that the word of God is not just some, a written book that, that's sitting in front of you. John told you that in the first chapter, first verses of the gospel according to St. John. He said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The 14th verse of that same chapter said, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That would be Jesus Christ himself. And, and the word is alive. And it's, 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 a, it's a living being and you can't just throw it to the side and a prophet come in and tell you something that doesn't line up with the scripture because remember the prophets of the old days which were only for the people of Israel when they said something it was supposed to be 100% correct 100% of the time and it wasn't saying that a check is going to come in the mail and tomorrow it doesn't come. And you know, it one day, eventually one will come and then they look like they were right. No, that's not the way that a prophet was in the Old Testament. And if they were wrong in the Old Testament time, they were to be put to death. So you, you were able to try the spirit, try that prophet, try that teaching, the teaching of that person by the spirit of God, by the spirit. And then we get into our text and it says, hereby know we the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus is coming to flesh is of God. And you say, well, wait a minute, doesn't everybody do that? That's what we were talking about. When we said, you ask those renowned teachers, what, is Jesus God? Is he God? And they start fumbling around and saying, well, well you know, he was the best and, and he was he was great and, and he, he was all of these things. But is he God? And they say, well, wait a minute. I, 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 I just don't see it like that. But here and is he God? Here John is saying, here is the test. This is the exam. Not only do you take the exam to see where you are, but you can give them the exam also. Is he God? He says, hereby know we the spirit of God. Who is the spirit of God? The third person of the Trinity. You, you, you can know the spirit of God. You can get to know the spirit of God. Jesus sent the spirit of God. He sent the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit that he's talking about. He talked to, to his disciples about the Holy Spirit in, that, in, in his discourse before he would go to the cross and, and in the 14th, 15th, 16th chapter of the gospel according to St. John, he said this in the seventh verse of the 16th chapter. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away to the comforter, the Holy Spirit will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, the spirit of God, the same one we're talking about here is come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall he hear, he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. This is what Jesus said concerning the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit living in them. They're born of the Spirit. They're indwelled by the Spirit. And and but 
every believer, even though they're indwelled by the spirit, every believer is not controlled by the spirit. There are two different things. They will be indwelled by because that is their surety, their promissory note. That is their, their down payment, their guarantee that God is going to save them in the end. But all of them are not walking in the right mindset of the spirit. They're not being controlled by the spirit all the time. But if they have not the spirit, Paul said in the eighth chapter of Romans, they're none of his. So they have to have the spirit, even though they're not letting their cells be controlled by the spirit at different times in their life. And we all can attest to that, that particular point right there. For hereby we know the spirit of God. We know him. He is the one that, that leads us and guides us in all ways of truth. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus is the Christ is come in the flesh. That, that it is, it confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Everyone that does that, everyone that confesses, that confess there means to acknowledge. If you looked up the word homologeo in there in the Greek, means to acknowledge, means to agree. And who are we agreeing with at this time? We're agreeing with God that Jesus Christ is his son and equal to him. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. He is God with us. Jesus and John is careful to say Jesus and Christ together as he explains this. Because remember, the false teachers were wanting to separate the two. Saying one is the savior and one is the anointed one and they're not the same person. So he said he's careful here to put Jesus is salvation and Christ, our, our anointed one that came to take away the sins of the world right there and, and put those together is come in the flesh is of God. This is sure. This is absolute. This is not confusing. This is the incarnation. Some of them at that time, the false teachers were denying the incarnation that Jesus Christ was born of a, of a virgin and came and lived in a, a in a fleshly body. Said no, he 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 was he was a spirit. He was he wasn't really a person that had a fleshly body. But Jesus Christ is coming to flesh. John said, if they don't believe that, then they're not of God. In the next verse, he would say that. So verse three says. And every spirit, this is an absolute statement also, that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is not of God. Every spirit that believes, that, that confesses not, that does not acknowledge, that acknowledge or agree that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh, that he came, robed himself in sinful flesh, yet without sin, lived a perfect life as the perfect lamb to die for our sins. If they don't believe that, John says here, they're not of God. That Not of God. That just can't be because they don't believe this absolute thing about Jesus Christ. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now, already is in the world. This is the spirit of Antichrist. This is not the Antichrist, the big thing that is going to be talked about by John himself. They're in, in Revelation, in that, in that prophetic book in this New Testament. So he says, but this is the spirit of Antichrist. What is the, the spirit of Antichrist? Antichrist refers to one that, that stands in opposition to everything that Jesus represents. And, and, and you say, well, wait a minute, you just said some renowned preachers and teachers stand above and, 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 and in front of people and they deny that Jesus is God. That denying that Jesus is God is standing in opposition to everything that Jesus represents. If he did not come to die for the sins of man, then, then what did he die for? He, he did. He just came and he just lived and he died. He didn't. It, it wasn't for what he came to do. So you stand when you don't believe these things, you stand in opposition to everything that he stands for. And you are standing in the place of anti Christ, a person that is anti Christ, anti the anointed one. It, this is the spirit of Antichrist. This is not the Antichrist. This is the spirit. This is the person that 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 denies the incarnation, the teaching of Jesus Christ. This is and this person even now already is in the world. John says, meaning that they were there at that time, and don't think that they left when John left off the scene. They're here here in our in our day and time 
right now. There is the spirit. There are people that are in de direct opposition to everything that Christ represents. We're going to see how big that is and how far reaching it is in just a second. But but now and then people deny the deity of Christ. They, they uh, Is he God? And they, they can't answer that question. Yeah, I believe he was great. But even now, now, already is in the world. We have some even right now, John is saying. Then our, our lesson, it actually goes down to the 13th verse, but we want to get some of those verses in between. The fourth verse says, you are of God, little children, and have, and have overcome. That's one of the words that we're going to be dealing with. Conquer is overcome there. Them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Those false teachers, that's what he's talking about. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us, and he is not of, of he, he that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth, the spirit of uh, and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and know God. That's what he's going to be reiterating right here as we go through these, these scriptures right here because verse 16 is going to say some of the same things that verse 8 is fixing to say now. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. He took our sin debt, the wrath of God that was that needed to be taken care of for our sins. Jesus Christ took it on him. That's what propitiation means, meaning he satisfied the righteous wrath of God. Behold, if God so loveth us, we ought to also to love we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Then verse 13, our printed text. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Here, here's how we know that he, he, we dwell in him. We dwell, to, to dwell, to, to stand in, to abide in, to remain in, to, to continue in. This, this, this dwell, mimo, meno in the, in the, in the Greek. That we dwell in him. How do we know that we dwell in him and he in us? Because he has given us his spirit. His spirit. Remember that, that Paul said that his spirit would be that thing that would seal us to the day of redemption. He would be that down payment. He has placed his spirit in us to seal us to the day of redemption. The first chapter of Ephesians and the fourth chapter lets us know that, that he is our earnest, that down payment. He has given us his spirit. How do we know this? We know it because he has given us his spirit, because we have every believer, we just said, is indwelled by the spirit of God, by his spirit. We have him in, in us. And we also stated, and we can't forget this, that every believer is not always controlled by the spirit of God. And, and we probably all fall into that from time to time in, in, in our walk with the Lord. Verse 14 says, and we have seen and do testify that the father has sent the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. John said that we have seen and do testify that which we have seen, which we have heard, which our hands have handled as he started out the, this, this, this epistle as he was writing here to the churches. He, he said, we, we have seen, we have, ha, we, eyes, our eyes have seen the, the, the Lord, not just Jesus Christ as he walked with us, but we saw the resurrected Savior. Our eyes have seen, and not only have we seen, we bear witness, which is testified. We give, uh, 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 and we do have definite evidence of what we have seen. We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If I can interject the whole world, he sent him to be the savior of the world. How do we know that? God so loved the world, John, Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter, 16th verse, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, that's the whole world, 
if anybody in the world believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. The Father sent the Son. We believe this. We do testify this. John wrote that about the third chapter of the gospel according to St. John as he wrote the experience that Jesus had with Nicodemus there at night. So he said that this we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, to die for the sins of the world. That's not just a simple statement that is made there. That means that he would have to die a brutal death, the death that the lamb would have to die when the priest would get the lamb and examine the lamb to see if he was a perfect lamb before he would kill that lamb to get the blood of the lamb, to sprinkle it on the mercy seat, to take away the person's sins for that period of time and then have to do it again next year. But Jesus died once and for all to do that for all of us. Not, be, not the love of God didn't do it, but because God loved the world, he did what it took to get us to the position where we can be saved by believing that Jesus Christ did die for us. Verse 15 says, whosoever shall confess or acknowledge that Jesus is the son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. That word confess again, homologale. There, there it is. Whosoever shall confess, but acknowledge that Jesus is the son of God. God in the flesh is what they're acknowledging. God dwelleth in that person. That, that And he in God, that means that they have a personal relationship. This is the pr privilege of all the, that confess Jesus is the son of God. God is with them and they're with God. God is in them. God dwelleth in them. God resides in them. He stays in them. How does he stay in them? Through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. We have been given the Holy Spirit. We've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We just said, even though we have the Holy Spirit in us, doesn't mean we're always being controlled by the Holy Spirit, but we do have him and we are saved if we have trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We believe that Jesus is God come in the flesh. Verse 16 says, and we have known and believe the love that God had to us. God is love, just as 8, chapter, 8 verse says, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. These, these are just say, reiterating the same thing, but it does say again here, that's not, that was not in our printed text that we did read. We have known and believed the, the love of the love that God has to us. How do we know it? Because of John, the gospel according to St. John, the third chapter, 16th verse, God is love. So this love that God is, the eighth verse said, he that, that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. But here is our conclusion here that God is love is what John is saying. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. How do you dwell in love? How, how do you minnow in love? How do you stay right there in love? How do you abide, remain, stand, and continue in this love? This is not the love of of. of a feeling. This is a love of choice. This is also agape love. This love is, is bigger than anything that we could, could possibly imagine. This love is a perfect love. This love is the love of God. We have known. We, it's, it's already been revealed, John said, to us. We, and we already believe the love that God has to us. We already believe it. Love is both experienced and and expressed in the life of the Christian is what John is saying here. It's both experienced and expressed. How do we express it? We, we express it even that person that can't stand us. We show them love. We show them concern. We show real and genuine concern. And if you start praying for people, you'll find yourself genuinely loving those people and wanting to see the best for them, not praying about them, but praying for them. You'll find yourself in a different light concerning a person that you pray for. And then verse 17 says, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. He said, herein is our love made complete 
that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Herein is the love made perfect, complete, with not lacking anything. What is this love? This love, lo love, the, the Bible te teaches us, the Apostle Paul teaches us, Galatians 5 the, is the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, I know you say everything else that comes after love in that session, but you won't have any of those other things without love. You won't have joy, peace, long-suffering, understanding. You won't have all of those things unless you have love. Love would have to be there first. So the Apostle Paul also wrote to the church at Corinth in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he wrote about love there also, didn't he? He talked about love. He, he said that, 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 he said, even if I spoke with the tongue of men and angels. He didn't say I do. He said, I, even if I did, spoke with the tongue of men and angels and had not love, it would just be me tinkering on a cymbal or, or hitting a gong. It wouldn't, it's just a bunch of noise is what it'd be. He said, if I didn't have love, he said, because this is what love is. This is what spiritual love. This is what the love of God is. This is what agape love is. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you right now, when you get down to verse eight, you'll realize that you can't have this apart from the spirit of God living on the inside of you. That's why it was important for us to say, greater is he that, that is in you than he that is in the world. So, so we, we, we go to that 13th chapter and we start at that fourth verse and it says, love, it suffers long. In other words, love is patient. Love is kind, not just some of the time, but it's kind all the time. Love does, does not envy or is not jealous of their, everything that happens around it. Love vaunt is not itself, is not boastful in, in things. Love is not puffed up or proud. It's not, it's not just over the edge and, and standing with his head up and acting like nothing can, can bother me. I'm just such a proud person. Does not behave itself unseemly. In other words, love is not rude or arrogant. In other, it, it seeks not her own, does not demand its own way. It, it's not easily provoked or not irritable. Think of not evil or no evil. Keep of no record when it has been wronged is, is what that means. Rejoice is not in, in iniquity. Never glad about injustice this, this love is, this agape love. Rejoices in truth when things come out on the right side. Beareth all things. In other words, never gives up. Believes all things. In other words, never loses faith and always hopeful. Endureth all things. And love, the verse, verse 8 of that 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians says it never fails. Maybe somewhere in the list you'll find yourself being able to do that one right there. But when you get down to verse eight, you see that this cannot be accomplished without the spirit of, of God, because this is the love of God. This is agape. When you get there and you see this love never fails, maybe you can successfully achieve some of the rest of them, even in your strength as a human. But when you get down here, even though you love that person, you think with everything in you, you might die and they try to call you and you, they, you don't answer. This love, it never fails. So apart from the spirit, you can't even experience agape love. And how is it bold? This, 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 we may have boldness in the day of judgment is what this scripture says because of this perfect love. Boldness because the love is perfected. How is it perfected? It's perfected in God. God has settled the sin question once and for all because of his son. He, he has done that because of Jesus Christ. Jesus overcame Calvary. He did overcome. He, he, did, he came, overcame at Calvary. Jesus said that it, to his disciples there in the 16th chapter of the, this gospel according to St. John, we talked about a moment ago, and, and in the 16th chapter, the 33rd verse, something that we didn't read, read he said, he said, this is so you would have peace. And in this world, in this world, you'll have much tribulation. Tribulation is going to be there. You're going to be pressed down and crushed. He said, but be of good cheer, for I have hupanikel the world. I have overcome the world or conquered, as we would 
understand the word to be. He said, I've conquered the world. The sin debt has been settled once and for all by Jesus Christ. That's why one day, even in judgment, we can stand boldly before the throne, knowing that is the, is the blood of Jesus Christ, the reason that we're here, that we're able to be there and the blood will never lose its power and we'll be totally saved. And there in the end, also, when we stand before the Lord in the end of this, this age, and then we, we switch to the, the fifth chapter, verse four and five. It says, for whatsoever is born of God, or whosoever is born of God, overcometh. Nickel, not the hooper Nickel uh, that Jesus had there, talked about there in the 33rd verse of the 16th chapter of the gospel according to St. John, but it is the same word if you went and referred back to one another. It means to conquer. It means to prevail over. It means to get a victory. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. How did they overcome the world? Because Jesus overcame the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith in what? Faith in who? Faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work at Calvary's cross. If you put your faith in man or in yourself or even in your own efforts to try to overcome or conquer or stand or, or prevail, then you'll find yourself lacking. But your faith is in Jesus Christ himself. How do you overcome this? How do you have victory over that particular sin that wants to come your way? It's because of what Jesus did. And some victories, you, some, some of them you may not win. But you will win the ultimate war because Jesus said, I have overcome the world. I have conquered this situation. Who is he that overcometh the world? Who is he that conquered the world is what the scripture is talking about. John is talking about. But he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God. We conquer the world by the word of testimony that Jesus is the son of God. Now, the word of his testimony, we realize that that came from Revelation, the, the 12th chapter, verse 11, as Satan was being defeated and cast out of heaven, his access passed being denied. We know in Job that he was able to go before God, but in the 12th chapter of Revelation, his access card is going to be terminated. He's going to be cast out of heaven, never able to come in again, and, and he's already been judged is what Jesus said. He's already the, 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 the prince of this world has already been judged the 11th verse of the 16th chapter of the gospel according to St. John. Who is he that overcome the world? Those that believe that Jesus is the son of God. They trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, a conquering faith. Father God, we do thank you today for the study of your word. And Father, we do pray that this word will simmer on and settle on our hearts and minds. Lord, help us to grow stronger in you as we realize that Jesus has overcome or conquered this world in this age, this world system. Father, we do pray that you will search our hearts, forgive us of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Sunday School Lesson Review. Hope to see you next week. God bless you all.